Welcome to Devalue with Mike and Caroline, the place where we talk about art and money and how creative people are navigating the ever-changing landscape of trying to make a living for their work. We're going to be interviewing all types of creative people, and we'll be talking about all types of issues that creative people face. We hope you'll get something out of it. We're excited to welcome you to Devalued. Hey, Mike. Hey, Caroline. Who are we talking to today? We're talking to Glenn Morrow, owner of Barnum Records and also a musician in Glenn Morrow's Cry for Help. I loved talking with him. What a great guy. Uh, very insightful. He has a lot of good information from the perspective of someone in a band and from someone who owns a record label. Yeah, this was a really cool conversation for, especially for musicians out there who are curious about what it's like to uh, put out a record on a label or what labels expect of you or um, what a label defines as a success. And, you know, one of the things that I really loved about it was like, He's so passionate about his artists Mm -hmm. and, you know, that, you know, if you're lucky enough to be on a label like that, that's the kind of thing that you should aspire to. And there was a moment so tender that I actually did cry. So let's check it out. Let's do it. Alrighty. So Glenn, the first question that we ask all of our guests is, do you think art and money go together? Uh... Well, they can go together. And certainly if you think about um, sort of the visual art world, you know, there's a whole quasi rigged game. It almost seems there and probably in the music business as well, to a degree, I would say, (laughs) but, but so money, yeah, they, they do go together. I mean, you, you know, great artists have made a lot of money and the people that work at the various highest level, like say someone like Prince comes to mind, you know, who cranked out all kinds of brilliant stuff very quickly, you know, just almost And some of these guys, you know, I don't particularly like say Ed Sheeran doesn't speak to me particularly, but I watched him put a song together and you know, he's just working at a level that's incredible. You know, just, he can do things on the fly, you know, that, that are Olymp, you know, they're like Olymp, they're Olympians, or or someone, you know, like John Mayer, another guy. I don't particularly like what he does, but you know, he knows little intricate things about how to, you know, bend a guitar string and then bend it back up, and, and so it goes sharp and flat, and you know, just like weird stuff. <laughs> I can't even begin to think about, you know, let alone his detail to making a yacht rock. <laughs> album but you know so you know you have to admire that that sort of that that artistry and where the money and the artistry sort of combine there with hard work and some ability to uh, reach the mainstream and that's not really where i live but um you know so yeah that's art and art and money together yeah i mean and where you live is kind of interesting to us because um you know, you, you're the label that you own, Barnum Records, is is very culturally important in the indie rock world. Um, talk about what success might mean in an indie rock setting. Let's say, like, you sign a new band, and um, how do they typically define success for a record that they put well, out with you? I don't know if uh, I don't know how they would define success, but and we've had, you know. We sort of, and here's where, where the art comes in maybe more than the uh, the money. You know, we sign, we tend to sign artists that we think are, are kind of unique and uh, we just like what they're doing. And you can make a record with people doing that and often they make the record themselves and you're just like, wow, this, this is great. It's done. Let's pick it up and we'll, get a couple options for a couple more records but that's a far cry from success you know um, but i would say if you can get a band that's you know actually got a booking agent is on the road selling merch (laughs) you know making some dents at radio and uh 
in, you know, getting those pitchfork reviews and, uh, and that's not easy. And I can't say that all our bands have gotten there, you know, but I think part of it is that we find bands that don't necessarily fit in the uh, sort of pre-programmed formats that, uh, you know, there's a lot of bands that are just like, uh, you know, they're in this kind of touring circuit and they're all kind of, they all sort of sound the same or, you know, and they're, you know, I won't mention any labels that are like that or, they're in the um, the festival circuit. They may never even play clubs, you know, but they go from festival to festival to festival, and they've got management that knows how to work the festivals, and um, they probably do more than play the festivals, but that's sort of their <laughs> linchpin, you know? That's yeah. sort of the, the cornerstone or where they're coming from. Or there are radio bands, you know, like commercial radio bands, or they've you know figured out some way to get those streaming numbers up that the majors just you know pick them up and you know make the gamble that they can make those streaming numbers higher so i'm losing track of the question here a little <laughs> bit but. do you think that uh that's what bands are kind of doing now is picking a lane and kind of going after that I don't know if they are, but it's it's an interesting idea. You know, you could you could also go after the art circuit. You know, where you where you play museums and um, art. You know, cultural centers. That's so. And I do. I know bands that that do that almost exclusively. Um. So it's an interesting idea. You know, we we tend to be like, oh, let's try to play the club circuit. I, I you know that tends to be where maybe we're just yeah it just feels like you know some people can crawl and crawl up into those other sectors like the band the front bottoms that we worked with you know they they play coachella and stuff like that but wow um um uh, but they're also just out there you know doing their own thing their own shows what kind of bands or artists do you look for when you when you think about si bringing on a new uh, signing. Well, the last band that I really got involved with signing was Little Hag, and <clears throat> I just saw on uh, Instagram um, uh, uh, a writer, Bob Macon, a Jersey Shore writer, was like, "This is the best, I don't know, best something of the year, best stars of the year." And I listened to a song. I was like, "Wow, that's really good." And sort of followed they were involved with some other people at the time and another label but it wasn't a label that hadn't totally gotten off the ground so we sort of stepped in and said let's see if we can make this bigger unfortunately the pandemic happened but she was just she's why i chose to wanted to work with her is she's uh she's a little you know uh i guess of the moment in terms of her politics and, and the kind of social issues she grapples with in her songs or, you know, not, not like overtly political, but although she's a political and like the messaging that she does on Instagram and whatever. The name is super hip. I totally got it from yeah. just that. Well, <laughs> and her, her real name is Avery Mandeville and the band when it started was called Avery Mandeville and the man devils. <laughs> no one could remember that, you know, including me. So she uh, she had an Instagram handle, Little Hag, and one day she was walking down the street and someone goes, hey, it's Little Hag. And she's like, huh. And Little Hag, you, you know, yeah, she's sort of embracing that idea like, you know, I can be whatever I, I can, you know, I can be as ugly as I want to be, whatever I choose to be. And, you know, someday she shows up and she looks like a movie star. And sometimes she just looks like, you know, she rolled out of bed. And uh, you never know which little hag is going to show up. <laughs> and then right, you know, right, who's going to come on stage that <laughs> night, you know. And, but beyond that, she's uh, really funny, you know, and she's not afraid to do things that are humorous. And I think that's true genius because, you know, I think a lot of, bands are too afraid to be funny you know? i agree we were just at talking the, about that at the same time 
she can break your heart, you know, she makes you weep with some of the songs, you know, mm. like she can just crush you. And to be, you know, I think, well, I guess one of my favorite artists of all time is uh, Paul Westerberg and the replacements. And she reminds me of Paul Westerberg, you know, in that kind of range of, uh, and a very unique voice and, uh, you know, just a great writer. Just, she can just write. Wow. And uh, anyway. That's very high price. That's why that's why I picked her. Another band that's that's new on the label that I didn't sign, but someone that we were that works at Barnum found. But then when I heard him, I was like, "Oh, this is really great!" It's a band from San Francisco <coughs> called Pardoner, and um, they they are like this indie rock slash punk slash hardcore hybrid type band, and they've got a song out right now. Uh, called um, "Are You Free Tonight?" and it and it just goes <laughs> starts out kind of like a slackery type thing, and then it just goes it just and, and the, you know it's got this like "Are you free? Are you really free? Are you free tonight?" <laughs> but are you really free? Are you free? <laughs> and then it just goes this hardcore double time, you know. Amazing. Over the top, that sounds amazing. Really, Whoa, that's so cool! <laughs> Check that out. They have an, an amazing video of it that's really funny and really kind of speaks to our dark, desperate times. Yeah. Sometimes. Right. So for anyone listening, that is how you want your label to talk about you <laughs> 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 with passion and interest and care. Um, yeah. I wondered, you've been in the game for a while and you've probably seen the music industry change a good bit. Um, I wondered, what you thought about artist development as the job of a label because it seems like several years ago that artist development was just something that was that was a big part of what a label would do is find an artist who could use some direction maybe uh or some some people to work with that would elevate them and Cheryl Crow put out what six or eight albums before anyone cared you know and this was something that could happen now it sort of feels like um labels or the whoever has the money is really uh putting the screws to artists to make money immediately um even quarterly so I wondered what you thought about that well, that's probably more of a major label kind of thing. Mm. Um, from an indie label, yeah, you can only, I guess, afford to keep supporting something that doesn't make money for, you know, I don't know, two or three records. If it's really, you know, if you're getting deeper and deeper in the hole. And usually, you know, after three records, the artist is either getting somewhere or they're starting to burn out anyway, you know, because it, it's, you know, looking back again, you know, like I said, I was in bands that toured and made money, and uh, but we only put out an EP and an album, <laughs> and we had like another album, you know, maybe in the can ready to go. But when I look back at it for twenty years later, it's like, yeah, for an artist to actually make three records and and do a whole touring cycle, maybe in a van, that's about all you you know. It's hard to sustain more than that. You know, I think there's very few people that can do it. You got to really just love it, you know, beyond anything. Otherwise, you're just going to burn out. Band members are going to quit. Um, someone's going to start, you know, having babies. All your friends that used to go to the clubs are having babies and they're not coming out anymore. You know. Do you think that the role of the label has changed since you've been with Bar None? Because um, I think you you have been with Bar None for like 32 years or something like that yeah 30 i think it's 30 i think it's 36 <laughs> all right yeah it's 36 yeah well, i made you younger in my version <laughs> um, it, i mean obviously it's gone through all kinds of permutations it was like the time when all the big box stores would just order tons of cds and you'd sell a thousand cds to blockbuster and then a thousand and one would come back and mm. uh or when NPR really was a, a powerhouse and just, you know, could make Amazon pop, you know, and they, you, you'd get the word, like, we're going to have these, you know, your band Mosquitoes, the song Boombox is going to be featured on this show. And, 
you know, you better be ready. And then, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, Barnes and Noble would buy in all these rec, you know, all the, everybody kind of knew what it meant. And, you know, that's, doesn't really happen quite like that anymore, or mm-hmm. it's not like a cornerstone of the indie thing. Um, there's not so many Barnes and Nobles anymore, and they're certainly not, you know, they're more about books and CDs, certainly. Um, so yeah, I've seen it change a lot. Uh, I think there's, you know, I, there's always artist development and you're always trying to hook the artists up with, you know, interesting people and people that you think will be fans and people that have been fans of things in the past that you did. And, uh, and you, I'd say we're, you know, it's less about being a gatekeeper now than it used to be. It used to be, you know, you were a bit more of a gatekeeper and there's still an element, you know, there's some element of that, 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 you know, something about the bar none brand or, you know, the people that we know um, and want to support us as much as they want to support the artists. But now, you know, the artists are like little promotion machines themselves with all the social media and, you know, what are the things that you can do that actually get traction? You know, college radio is kind of a shadow of its former self because of the bigger, you know, some college radio stations say like, uh, you know, BRU in Providence, those Brown station, you know, a big transmitter. Like if you got on BRU, you, you know, you were, that was going out to a wide area of people that meant, you know, concert tickets were going to be sold, the whole thing. Well, they sold their tower and, you know, it's a little dorm radio station at Brown now. And that's kind of played out all over the country. Wow. So, you know, that's just one area, you know, back, back in the day with the replacements, you know, left of the dial, that was like a thing, you know, like a right. place where yeah. people, uh, you know, where a community lived and it's still there to a degree, but it's not really what it was. And I'm trying to wrap up that point by saying, yeah, the artists are now their own promotion machines. Uh, and you can do some artist development, but um, we're no longer necessarily the gatekeepers. And everyone's just, yeah, it's just a bigger hustle all around. And in some ways more egalitarian, you know, it's not like the cool band that, the cool kid buys or the, you know, record collector buys the cool band and plays it once and then puts it on a shelf. You know, you, 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 that kid, if he's doing it on that same thing on Spotify, it's not going to generate much money for anybody. So, you know, the new gatekeepers are the bands that the kids want to keep clicking on and putting on their playlists and, tick tock into or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, what would you say to someone who was interested in starting a label now? It just seems it's a very different, it seems like a very different game. I mean, you can do a lot of things without ever, you know, without making any product if you want, you know, you can, it's all, it seemed to be, and I mean, you know, like, like people doing beats on YouTube, you know, and selling beats on YouTube. That's a thing. Um, there's all these, di- yeah, there's whole new different ways of doing things, uh, that I feel like I don't truly understand. <laughs> and, I don't think any of us understand. I, I, would, I would have to, <laughs> you'd have to be like a young person that kind of burrowed into some aspect of some world that you found and then stumbled on a couple, you know. Well, I think I used to say this a lot that naivete gets you very far. <laughs> you know, when we started, we, we were very naive and you just do things and you don't know any better. And sometimes you stumble on things that a more seasoned professional wouldn't even see, you know, just because you have enthusiasm. Mm. So I would say there are ways forward. People are, you know, there's, there's all kinds of uh, people doing all kinds of stuff out there. Um, so it sounds like in your case, niche is good. You've made a career out of being a niche label. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I, a niche, but we also kind of see ourselves as sort of, you know, we we fear no genre. We that's one thing we say. Like, you know, it doesn't have to, you know, partners like this. You know, feels like a pretty you know hardcore punky thing. And then we have you know winter doing dream pop, and you know we're not just like working like a niche. I think a lot of actually, I think a lot of labels just work like a very specific niche you know punk yeah, right, or, right. Or psychedelic or garage and they only do that and the good thing about that is then you build a community of like-minded people who can go tour with each other and and people really know what they're going to get I, I feel like we sort of have to you know build o- over from scratch each time with each artist that we we find and, and people maybe go like oh yeah they tend to find interesting things so they give it a shot but it's not you know it's not all in the same genre Hmm. do you what are what are your opinions about the vinyl resurgence is it is it real from your perspective or is it how important is it to each release (laughs) well we're at the point where we we've done we're barely doing cds at all anymore um we're doing some cassettes yeah a lot of bands here yeah. have cassettes yeah. <clears throat> yeah the partner cassette i haven't got the vinyl in yet i've been listening to the partner cassette and it's like damn <laughs> that sounds good you know <laughs> did i play both sides already <laughs> <laughs> um the uh vinyl yeah for us it's come back and it's it sort of tortures us because you end up making a bunch and you can't keep it all at your distributor. So it just slowly creeps up in the office. And we actually had to move because we had too much vinyl and it was out in the hall and we had to find a better situation with a better freight elevator. And we're at a, we're sort of at, we we just did a front bottom, uh, a 10th anniversary album for the front bottoms with a, a, a big mail order component. And it's, it's been, uh, <laughs> super fun it's been super fun but i really am good at packing up boxes you know it's mm-hmm. totally diy you know wow that's awesome so w- t- tell us about the infrastructure of bar nine uh, oh and i'll just say this too yeah. this just happened today uh i get i get a freight bill <laughs> and it's for like twenty eight hundred dollars i'm like and I asked the guy I work, I asked Mark where I work, and he's like, oh, that must have been that skid of records. Like, you know, we actually had to pack up a skid of records, you know, and shrink wrap it, this big giant thing that had had, got, had come to the office by accident. So we packed it all up on a skid. And just when a, a truck was coming, with, uh, loading all this stuff from us, we put this on skid, but they charged us $2,800. So I had to go, like, argue on the phone. They dropped the price to 1100 really quickly. And then they said, and you can call this, e- you know, write this email address and you might, you know, and say that, you know, that you didn't even have to order a truck and maybe you can get it reduced more. And meanwhile, I'm looking at other bills and they're a lot less. So, you know, that was a vinyl problem that happened today. And, you know. Wow. It's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about the infrastructure of Bar None. How many people work at Bar None? um how, what what does everybody do there like we we haven't interviewed any label people so we're very curious about what goes it's on it's been very strange because of the pandemic and you know we were a small label we're sort of creeping back into the office more and more especially if there's a lot of mail order <laughs> too. but you know really with the pandemic you can work from anywhere right and you know do most most of my banking you know is done online and um uh, Mark, who's the other full-time employee, you know, he, he often, he's doing marketing stuff and just everything on his computer, you know, you have your drop boxes and your, you know, cloud stuff. And you, you, unless you really have to touch physical product or, you know, you want to kind of meet with other people or have a little synergy, uh, you don't really have to be in the office. Our office, I, I as I said, I have a band, and we do have like a, one side of the office has like uh, equipment set up so I can re- I rehearse there, 
the space used to belong to Chris Butler from the waitresses who had uh, the hits with uh, I know what boys like in Christmas rapping. And <laughs> he, he decided to leave one day for the Midwest. And just as we were getting drowning in vinyl and we took over his space. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, we sort of, a, we share the space with some other people that sort of come and go, whether it's some musicians and, uh, 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 a, a music licensing company and um, a royalty uh, software company. And there's a little bit of, you know, give and take between us all. And uh, it's been great to have a, a music licensing company uh, on the premises because, <laughs> you know, you go, oh, hey, how about this? You know, oh, yeah, We're looking for something here. Yeah, I just so got that, into artist management positive. in the last year, um, and I've learned so much about just how many different jobs have to happen in the music industry. Um, you kind of know the basics, but wow, there's a job for every single thing. Right, and for thing. instance, like music music uh, licensing companies, well, who's you can't all bother the music licensing company. That might, you know, let the manager put the pressure on. You know, you can provide the music. But maybe let the manager, you know, be the the point person because they're managing a specific artist. Where you've got, you know, your whole catalog, and uh, you know, that might be a, a place where a manager would be a better, you know, point person. You mentioned that you were in a band, and your your band name is uh, one of the, my favorite things ever. <laughs> <laughs> so good, Glenn Morrow's "Cry for Help." Um, <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about it and like, why is it called that? <laughs> well, we were trying to come up with a name and, you know, sort of going back, you know, some people know who I am from, I, I had a band, the individuals, another band called Rage to Live. And actually that one was originally Glenn Morrow's Rage to Live. And we just changed <laughs> Rage to Live. That's funny. But uh, this time around our, our bass player just said, how about Glenn Morrow's Cry for Help? It's the best <laughs> way. Laugh like you're laughing now. And, I said I'll t I'll take one for the team. And, uh, <laughs> well, I wondered if that had anything to do with like you owning a label and knowing exactly what it takes to put out music and mm -hmm. make music a reality, and because yeah. it's, it would seem like you would have to be an insane person <laughs> to actually do it, right? Yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> I think. I mean, I think there was a time, you know, before. Uh, uh, you know, all the tech startups became the sexiest thing. Like it was really like it was kind of sexy to you know run an independent record label. That was like the cool thing in that you know the late '80s. You know when Nirvana was breaking and you had Sub Pop and you know right. all these sort of mon. You know, I mean, so they're, they're still out there doing it, but um, yeah, it was kind of almost like the the great cool uh, entrepreneurial thing to do. I think that moved on to, you know, tech, but you know, it's maybe it'll swing back now that tech's <laughs> suffering a little. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> why do you do it now then? Uh, well, make music or do the label? Mm, I guess uh, be involved in music at all. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I question the band of what I'm trying to do with the band or why I do it. And then you have like a really great gig and it's just so much fun. And, mm. you know, it's like, wow, I'm writing songs that I've, you know, that seem like improvements on things I've written before, or at least are different, you know, than things I did before. And I just want to know what's going to happen. You know, what, I have a song, what happens next? You know, I just want to see what happens next. So I'm constantly, you know, something just keeps pushing it forward. And oddly, I had a, a, a strange, uh, I might get a little emotional <laughs> talking about this. You know, I'll try to keep it brief, but I have a friend who's my age that's got um, early onset dementia and is in a state facility and, uh, I went and uh, saw her for the first time in that facility and 
a mutual friend of ours suggested that I bring my guitar along and, uh, you know, there I, there I find myself in this community room with a bunch of the, the, the residents there and music. I mean, there's, these are my friend. She used, said yes a couple of times and she said, okay. I think once she didn't speak other than that. And, but we were all in fifth grade together and we knew this Hoagie Carmichael song, the whale song. And I started singing it and she knew every word and she sang right along with me. And, wow. and then I sang like, you know, to this group of people, I sang Beatles songs and just, you know, Sinatra songs and Todd Rundgren songs. And they were all there, you know, singing along to, or well, some of them were slumped over asleep, but, <laughs> um, but you know, that's the beautiful. power of music. Yeah. And that was as, as meaningful an experience as I've, you know, playing in a band or anything else. Yeah, that's so. beautiful. Thank you for that. Yeah. One of your one of my favorite songs uh from your from Glenn Morrow's Cry for Help is the one where you talk about the guy that loses his record collection B to Z. Uh, that's true <laughs> i was gonna ask about that because that seems yeah. like a record label owner's worst nightmare <laughs> yeah that that actually happened He'll, he likes to tell the story because then people send him free records but <laughs> matthew kaplan my lawyer uh has floor to ceiling records in his office and when hurricane sandy happened all the records on the, from v to z on the bottom shelf got destroyed so hmm. you know he's looking for his velvet underground records <laughs> and his uh frank zapper records and uh uh yola tango yeah <laughs> right right you could take care of that one right <laughs> yeah <laughs> tell us a little bit about um like some of the success uh stories that you've had at bar none over the years like you know obviously everyone knows the feelies and yola tango but tell us some about some of the other ones that um, have have really um, done really well for the label. Yeah, and and then there's also the ones that uh, we started something, but then you know they actually had success when they went to other places, which mm. is interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, you know, we did the early of Montreal records, but it was really not until later when they kind of rejiggered their formula a little bit and had kind of more dance beats beneath their music that they, they kind of exploded with the kids, but we did their first three records, but, um, and we started, I mean, the first rec record on, was my band rage to live. And I did get on MTV, but I didn't sell that many records. <laughs> but then I said to Tom Prendergast, who started the label, um, Hey, I found this band. They might be giants. And why don't we work with them? And again, total, naivete and i without going into the whole story you know we ultimately got them on mtv and the buzz bin and you know that really we were off to the races then yola tango we you know they were old friends of mine from when i worked at uh new york rocker um ira and i worked there and we sent them off in a van opening for uh the sundays do you remember them yeah i do i do they, they had one like kind of hit that I can't remember what it was called, but it was like a poppy British. Yeah, melodic something about book. a book, or I think it was like uh, I can't. I, but it was she had a beautiful voice. Can't yeah, remember. and it it was kind of sounded like fake book, which was the record mm. we were promoting. So Yola Tango went out and did fake book in front of the Sundays, and they that really like sort of you know put them you know in a place where they they could tour the country and start developing and they obviously went in many different directions after that um and they're still going today and i i'd say you know they might be giants in yola tango i, I if any, there's a certain pride in the fact that i i can't think of any other bands uh that have a through line that never you know that never stopped playing yeah and just kept going you know all the way through as those entities, you know, maybe they had some personnel changes, but 
they're still going and you know still making uh you know credible music which and playing for a lot of people you know yeah both uh um, they might be giants and yola tango played here really recently and mm-hmm. the, the shows were sold out and i mean they're yeah. killing it yeah most bands break up for a while or they the guy goes solo or mm. um you know and then they come back and they realize they like it and they make a couple more records that kind of thing but those two bands man they just i don't think i can't think of anybody else maybe there are others but you know that that could actually sustain make, making a living and i mean you must be an expert at this like what oh, wait, is let me just say i'll throw oh, in sure. a couple of yeah architecture and helsinki was another one that did really well for us they got a break by uh death cap for cutie took them out and they they did really well um the front bottoms are, you know, just a cornerstone of what we do. And in some ways are a lot, like they might be giants because it's two guys that were best friends from being uh, a very young age. I do find actually that's a thing, you know, if bands have two members that are really key core tight, you know, whether it's John and Paul or uh, Ira and Georgia or, you know, uh matt and brian from the front bottoms you know they just have this like intense connection that that spurs them forward and and over you know allows them to move across time and space i always Um, wonder how solo musicians do it it seems so hard to stay motivated to keep going and stay inspired so maybe having yeah I, i always give a shout out to uh steve Wynn from the dream syndicate who he has just hung in there and you know they're still awesome too ebbs and flows you know and i would put him in that category as ira as a yola but i I don't think dream syndicate really played the whole i think he went solo for a long time before the (laughs) dream syndicate came back yeah and and the feelies again that was that's one of my uh i'm very sort of that i was able you know they took a big break after they made their first four records and they kind of disappeared for nobody thought they were going to come back including me and i was surprised when they you know uh bill from the band reached out to me while i was driving on 95 in a blizzard and that had literally stopped traffic on 95 he he wanted to talk about the feelings getting back together and i'm driving through these suburbs (laughs) trying to find a way out and but meanwhile not wanting to you know, stop the conversation. <laughs> they're one of my favorite bands of all time. And they're, they're comeback records. The records that you put out, I guess, you know, more recently of theirs are some of their best albums ever. And I saw them at the cat's cradle. Um, and they did like 10 encores. Like it was yeah. crazy. Like they were they, so good. They loved and they love, yeah, they just did a two and a half hour show in Baltimore. That went really well. And, um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but when's this podcast going up? Um, we could wait until uh, you're. I mean, you're well, I mean, <laughs> they're they're releasing a very special. We're going to do a double live album, but it's a very specific thing that's going to be done, uh, and you'll be hearing about that soon. Well, that's exciting. That is exciting. And, really yeah, and it. Oh boy, I was just listening today in the car, and <clears throat> it, it kills. And then, uh, and I think that they're basically, you know, clearing the decks to do some more work. So make, get another record done. That's awesome. And, That's exciting. Yeah. We got the scoop on the feelies. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there is something that I grappled with a lot when I, uh, was working on my little label and I wondered if you, uh, felt the same when you sign a label, do you kind of accept or hope? that they'll move on to a major or some other, maybe it's a person moving on to a different project or any sort of, um, you want to give your whole heart to them as a band or an artist, but understanding the fact that it may not be forever. It cuts both ways. You know, I think, and I I have to say we've never, if the bands (laughs) either it crashes and burns early you know, or 
Um, if it does have longevity, then I think they tend to sort of feel that they want to, you know, they want to be in bigger pastures. I, I know that I, I certainly did when I when I had the band that the label that I was on. I didn't want to give them that next record. I wanted to, you know, get signed by a major label and blah blah blah. Um, yeah, I think there's that natural desire to keep growing. And in many cases, you're better off, I think, with, you know, you let them go and maybe hold on to the, some back catalog for a period of time or infinitely. And um, you, you might be in better, you know, that might be let someone else do the investing, you know, in their in their future. Yeah, we did that um, with Margot Price. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She's like a Americana artist. Um, Margot Price? Yes. And we signed her very first band. And, you know, very soon after we invested every penny we had in vinyl, she split off into her solo thing. And that was devastating for a moment. Yeah. And now it's fine, you know. Can we sell still those records them? on eBay? Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I hope yeah. that's happened for you too. Oh, yeah. It, yes. Multiple times. And, you know, there were times when I was just like, I can't believe it. You know, we got, they screwed us. And then it, in the end, it turned out the whole thing sort of flipped and it all worked out and everybody stayed friends and they went, you know, they did, went off and we kept selling stuff. So I can't pretend that, you know, there's one, one size fits all or, um, you know, I'm a little envious. I'll admit, I'm a little envious of the labels that just get those indie rock bands again. Back, you know, that kind of touring machine indie rock band where they're never going to be uh, whatever thirty-seven co-pilots or whatever that band is called. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, they're, they're, they've got this thing, and they can just keep marching along, and they're going to stay with the label because the label is well-funded and. You know, and they just probably until they just can't stand touring anymore, and and it's they just stop because they want to make you know maybe there's you know a lot of people are smart people and they can do more than just be in a band. And after you've done ten records and ten tours, you might just be like, you know, I've been there and I've done that. I don't necessarily. I kind of felt that way after a while, just with the touring aspect of music. Like, man, you know, I've been to all these cities, like five, six times. It's kind of cool, but I don't necessarily have to keep having this experience. And, you know, I want to do some other things. So, so there you go. One of the cool things about the vinyl era or like the vinyl resurgent era, I should say, is um, reissues and all the stuff that comes with that. And and I noticed that even you, you put out um, some Alex Chilton records as well. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I did mention Alex and uh, the Langley School Music Project, which mm. is a classic uh, 70s children's album. These albums that were made with a children's choir, kind of like uh, by like a, like a Hans Finger, this hippie school teacher in the 70s <laughs> that were then discovered. And yeah, we just repackaged them in their original record jackets and wrapped them up so it kind of looks like the cd but gigantic and, <laughs> right cool um it's kind of cool and yeah alex that i mean alex other than paul westerberg i mean he pro even more than paul westerberg uh my you know great inspiration to me and a hero and i saw him play from you know at cbgb's in the 70s all the way you know till till the end of his life and um that was a real pleasure to kind of compile um uh, the records that the we put we did like a, a greatest hits of his solo stuff called um from memphis to new orleans yeah that's and awesome. i wrote the liner notes for that and you know spent an inordinate amount of time suffering over that <laughs> and and then the other guy found some rec tracks that had never been out and put together this sort of uh jazz record uh Songs from Robin Hood Lane, I think it's mm. called, right? Music from Robin Hood Lane. And that was cool. You know, it's like, hey, an Alex Chilton kind of Ameri sings the American songbook. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, that, I'll take that. And That's he, awesome. You know, he, he's constantly surprising because there's 
there's things that are still out there that you're just like, really? That exists? And it's kind of amazing. And it's also cool because as a as an owner of, of a label and someone that puts out records, like seeing the, this resurgent interest in um, old records, I would imagine that gives you kind of op that makes you that would make you optimistic about the records that you've put out as well. And and they, they might have a records might have a longer life than you, you initially thought. Yeah, actually, we're just we just put out um, Mark, who I work with, worked at Atlantic twenty years ago and uh, signed this band Ivy that was a side project of Adam Schlesinger from Fountains of Wayne. Yeah, kind of a, a Eurocentric Sarah Records, Bossa Novish, French Chanteuse <laughs> that sounds great. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and a lot of people really, you know love those records back in the day they've never on vinyl so uh mark reached out to them and they were like man you're the guy you know you got us you gave us our start and and adam schlesinger you know sadly he died of covid like mm. heartbreaking and um so you know i don't think ivy's necessarily going to tour but um there's just a lot of love for those records and you know younger they were kind of really forward thinking kind of records so uh younger younger people have picked up on them um and so that moves forward so uh, they might be giants um my friend gina arnold just wrote something about them where she was like yeah you know when i was a parent they started doing kids records and you know it's kind of helped me with my parenting you know like uh, and and emmy who i work with now has a two-year-old and she's like oh yeah i'm almost they might be giants disney records i just play you know i play them for birdie all the time and it's awesome uh and but because of that you go to a they might be giant show and there's people of all ages there mm -hmm. you know it's not just um it's not just you know the the people that discovered them in, in the late 80s on mtv right multi-generational yeah <laughs> so i wondered if there's any expectations that you have for fans that you're looking to sign because i think that would be a pretty big question that a lot of people would want us to ask like let's say you're looking at a band are you looking at like you know what their social media following is are they touring do they have you know is it is it more about um the music or is it or is it about everything i uh i do i do think it's mainly about the music but you you sort of have to have a few add-ons you know <laughs> um you know a, a sense that the artist has a great live show uh maybe has made some inroads they may not have a booking agent but they you know figured out how to get into some other markets besides their own we often get involved with artists at that level. And, um, you know, sometimes it's like really heartbreaking. It's just like splitting hairs. Like I almost want to do this record, but I just don't love it enough. Even though they've got, you know, they've got guarantees at triple a radio and they've got a manager and some, they swear this booking agent's ready to pick them up and, They've licensed all these sync, you know, got all these sync licenses. Sometimes you, do, you, you know, if you don't love the music, you just, you just can't go there. Yeah. Despite all the bells and whistles that, that are attached. That makes complete sometimes, sense. Yeah, sometimes as artists, things are really out of sync. Like, well, they've got a booking agent. They've, they've played some festivals, but like they have no Instagram following. And you're just like, what? Always that's so kind of mysterious. Weird. I know. Yeah. Or someone who has a ton <laughs> of Instagram followers and nothing else going. Right. I, right. I never understand. They must know uh, some marketing or <laughs> something secret that we know. Something like that. Well, I, I have I have one thing to share, and that is that I my own personal Instagram, like a camera, too. <laughs> L-I-K-E-A -L it's it's like a virgin rather than a, a, like a camera yeah. like, like a camera too um, 
<laughs> I, I went to Mexico recently and there was a guy chopping up melon, making this stuff called fruit gazpacho. And it was really fascinating. He had this like, he jammed a fork into the, into the, uh, <laughs> What did I say he was cutting? He was cutting a mango. He, so he, he stuck some kind, something in the mango, and then he's just like chopping it up and then adding it to this uh, uh, jicama and then adding pineapple to that. Anyway, I made a little video of it, and I, you know, I posted it as a reel. And that was about four weeks ago. It went viral. <laughs> and... <laughs> People all over the world are liking it. I've got like 4,000 people have liked it. And, you know, all these people are suddenly following me. It's, it's you know, it's very strange. It's weird. <laughs> I'm going to follow I mean, you I, right I after this. I had like about 900 followers. And now I have like, I don't know, I have like 11, you know, I got like 200 new followers like in the last three weeks. It, it, but from all over the world. And, <laughs> That's amazing. You got pressure on you Bible. now. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to become a, you know, just pictures of uh, people preparing food. <laughs> but You're an influencer. Yeah. <sighs> I, I, I'm, I just thought today, maybe, maybe it's time to, you know, have to put the request, you know, not just be open and, and put the, you know, request filter on. <laughs> 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 I love that for you. <laughs> yeah, insta famous. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, but it's weird. You know, you spend all this time creating content, and then something like that happens. It's just like, well, I don't really have to do anything. It's just, <laughs> it's just doing it for itself, right? It's like AI. <laughs> A song that you worked on for years, you know, might get. A couple hundred listens, and then a right. Instagram video of a man cutting up a mango. Yeah, is you never know. your legacy? I know. <laughs> <laughs> the the, the, the uh, Lyle, the music uh, licensor, said to me, "You should have put a song behind it, <laughs> right? It would have made seventy five dollars." <laughs> now we know. I kind of like this. I think the sound it's very ASMR because the guy's like <laughs> you know really whacking the. A mango. Maybe that's the hot tip of this is if you're going to make a video, put a, put your song behind it. Yep, that's true. Yep. And yep. Whacking the Mango sounds like a great album name for you. <laughs> <laughs> this has been good for everyone. At least a song title. Yeah. <laughs> um, one final question. So this is something that I've always wondered about labels um, and I think a lot of our listeners would want to know this. Do, do, do people at the label actually listen to the demos that come in? Uh, you know, <laughs> it's getting harder because it's just, you know, it's easy. Someone just can, you know, put a mailing list together and hit send. And, you know, if they send you like something that you have to download and they, I have to really like something to download. Most times I just say, could you just make a SoundCloud file, please? And, you know, that's if I actually want to listen to it. Right. So I have to say, I can't, I just can't, you know, I can't correspond with everybody anymore. And it, it saddens me. And the old, but there, you know, there were times like, I remember I once went through this huge, twice I went through huge piles of stuff. And one time I found a band, Chocolate USA that we did two records with. And they ultimately came like, they were like the beginning of the whole um, elephant six thing. And Julian Costner, who was in that band ended up in nuclear, uh, nuclear, uh, neutral milk hotel, mm. as well as many other bands. And, um, the other one was a band from, um, uh, North Carolina, uh, the glands. Yeah. I found amazing band. Amazing band. Yeah. And I, I got to see them here. Our... I got to see them here before he died. Yeah. What an incredible songwriter. Yeah. And we did, we, we put out that first record of theirs and they weren't really, they, I don't think they played any shows. Was, yeah. And, but what a great, yeah. What a great band. And yeah, so many great, great songs on that record. And then they made a record for Capricorn and, you know, had a real budget and yeah. Uh, and, and then, now yeah, I would get like I would get like call like years and years later I would get call you know like uh, what's it Gorky's psychotic Munchies, yeah, that what they yeah. were called the Welsh band 
you know, that wanting to know about the glands or Ira would suddenly be from the other thing would be like, yeah, what's with this band with glands, you know? And, and he was just working in a record store at the school kids records. That's fun. Yeah, that's right. And that so first I, album. I do like. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. The Pretty Marina. I love that song. Oh, Pretty Marina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know what? I, and I love that. You know, in some ways, I, I do feel like there's a there's a sort of curating thing that I've I've done. That yeah, they don't all sell. Like not all the paintings don't sell, but um, they're all great paintings, as far as I'm concerned. You know, sonic oral paintings. And uh, I'm I there's very few records that I I regret. You know, putting out. I hope if someone sends through an email with the subject line whacking the mango that you'll give it a listen. (laughs) (laughs) God, definitely. definitely. (laughs) Well, Glenn, thank you so much for your time. This has been absolutely awesome. Yeah, it's a fun, uh, you know, I didn't have any idea. I I, I thought this was going to be a lot more like, I'm going to have to remember a lot of names that I'm not going to be able to remember. (laughs) Uh, this worked out. This was really, really fun. Really insightful. So thank, you. thank you. Thanks for listening to Devalued. For more information about our podcast, please visit devalued.show.